I'm going to just go slideshow, play from start. OK, so what we're going to talk about today is uh, your workers are arriving. What are some big things you need to know? We're also going to talk a little bit about when they're leaving. And it's kind of a similar topic. So uh, we're just going to go over that. Again, when you have questions, put them in the Q&A. And I'm going to answer all the questions at the end of this. That's usually where we get to have the most fun. Although I do find the PowerPoints particularly fun as well. All right. Oops. Whoa, whoa, whoa. All right. So my workers are arriving. How do I onboard the workers correctly? So one thing to know is actually prior to arrival, uh, prior to the worker actually being issued their visa, this is something that should be done in their home country. Uh, the workers need to have a copy of the work contract, which is the job order that's filed with the state workforce agency in their own language. And they need to sign it prior to the issuance of their visas. And this is one of the first things the Department of Labor will ask about in an investigation. So it's uh, something to pay close attention to. Uh, have your workers and anyone recruiting on your behalf sign a no charge contract. This is a big deal. This is a big problem in H2 uh, world, whether it's H2A or H2B. This is something that the Department of Labor is well aware of, uh, is the exploitation of the workers by being charged by the person referring them. Uh, and so what, and the, the problem for the employer is it lands back on the employer, whether or not the employer actually knew of it. So uh, the way that you cover your, your tracks here is you have both the person that is recruiting on your behalf, which is actually a requirement of the regulations, uh, sign a document that says that they're not charging people for the opportunity to work on an H2B visa. And then also when your workers arrive, one of the things you want to have them sign is a document that says that they have not been charged for the opportunity uh, to work on an H2B visa for your company. Uh, so that's an important thing to have them sign upon onboarding. That would be one of the first things I actually have them do. Uh, can I give my employees an advance? This one comes up all the time. Workers get here. They don't have a lot of money, don't have a lot of resources. And so employer wants to give them an advance and then deduct it from their uh, paychecks. Well, you can give your employees an advance. The second question, can I deduct it from their payroll? This is a two-part test that you need to go through. Uh, the first thing you need to check to determine if you can properly deduct from payroll is check your job order. Does your job order provide that deductions may be taken from the workers' checks uh, for advances? If yes, then you then you can deduct it to, up to the amount that you advance. Uh, there's two types of deductions, which we'll get into in a little bit. There's lawful and reasonable deductions. And we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, the, just so you know, if you are going to try to deduct anything from your workers' paychecks, you need to check the job order to make sure that it was disclosed, that you could uh, deduct that. Otherwise, you can't. And then if it is disclosed, you need to make sure that it's the proper amount, not more than necessary. Uh, the other thing is whenever your workers arrive, and we have this on the same document for our clients, but whenever your workers arrive, you want to notify them of their duty to leave the United States. And you want to do it in uh, their, it needs to be in their language and have them sign it. So that's part of our onboarding, uh, con or our, our onboarding documents. They'll sign something saying, yeah, I wasn't charged for the opportunity to work on HB visa. And yeah, I received a copy of my work contract in my home country. And yeah, I uh, was notified of my duty to leave the United States upon expiration of my visa or at least be transferred to a new employer, but they do have, that is a requirement for employers. Okay, uh, what do you need to pay your workers whenever they get here? So the requirements of what workers are entitled to and something that the Department of Labor will check in any audit is that the workers were paid for their travel, meals, and hotel from their home to the consulate city then from the consulate city to the place of employment. Where people normally get tripped up here is they normally get tripped up with the trip from their home to the consulate city. Uh, they normally don't pay that. Most people pay 
from the content city to the place of employment, but they don't know they have to pay that trip from their home to the content city. Uh, so that's an important thing to know. And that's something the Department of Labor asks about every time they that because they, they know that they can generally get people on that one. Uh, when do I need to pay it? Uh, th this is a little bit stickier of a of a point. Technically, under the regulations, you don't have to do it until the workers complete half the work contract. But uh, we always, for our clients, we always recommend that you just pay it on the first check. Just pay it on the first check, so you don't have to worry about being in violation of FLSA, which can and often does happen if you don't put it on the first check. And then also be sure to do an I-9 for your workers. Uh, how do I fill that thing out? So there's there's a manual online that you can use. We can also send it out uh, that tells you how to properly fill out an I-9. Uh, but the other thing to know is that whenever you're, if you're, let's say you're transferring workers from one application to another, you need to re-verify them. So you saw the re-complete section three every time you transfer workers from one application to another as well. Uh, don't forget to get your workers their social security number. The consequences for your workers not getting a social security number are really steep. So it's important that you do, in fact, get your workers uh, their social security number. That should be one of the first things you do whenever they get to the United States. So that's what you do when your workers are arriving. Now let's talk a little bit about what you need to do whenever your workers are returning home. So you, you're required to pay for the transportation from the place of employment back to their home city, not to the consulate, unless they live in the consulate city, uh, but back to their actual home city. Again, this is the part that trips everyone up. They think I just got to pay back to Monterey, for example, but the worker doesn't live in Monterey. They live three hours outside of Monterey. You need to pay them for the travel back to their actual home. Uh, we always have our clients, whenever they're offboarding, the exit documents for our clients have another no charge agreement, meaning uh, I was not charged for the opportunity to work on an H-2B visa. And uh, that same document states that as far as the employee is aware, the employer has met all their obligations under the work contract. And we also have them do something to indicate if they want to come back next year to work for the employer. Uh, it's a, it's a good good way of ensuring you have the same workforce coming back year after year. Uh, it's also a good way to, to cover your tracks and avoid trouble with the Department of Labor in an audit. Okay, so there's, now this is a, this is a fun one because the Department of Labor really likes to get people on this one. So whenever you're keeping track of your workers' hours, there's two things that you need to be pay attention to. There's earnings records and then there's hours and earnings statements. These are two separate documents. Uh, there's one that is meant for internal use, so internal uh, data that you maintain. The other one is meant for external use in, in that you actually transmit it to the workers on or before each pay period. I'm not going to go into the details of what all is included in that, uh, but it does include things that aren't generally produced on a normal pay stub, like the employer's FEIN. Uh, that's uh, very rarely actually on pay subs, but that's one of the things the Department of Labor will check for right away. Uh, and so the difference between the two is one of them is maintained internally. The other one is transmitted to the workers on or before each pay period. And the, the thing that I like to have people do is just consolidate them into one that is transmitted to the workers every pay period because then it's just easier. You, you're able to systemize it to where their workers are getting it you are maintaining it internally and you're compliant with both of those provisions. Uh, if you have them separated, it's generally harder to actually be, be uh, in compliance with the regulations. How long do I have to keep these? You need to keep them for at least three years. Uh, so be sure to maintain those records for at least three years. That's how far back the Department of Labor can go. So, Okay, so whenever you're paying your H2B workers, the wage rate, is the highest, the prevailing wage rate, or the federal or state minimum wage rate. I guess the only other thing that I would put in here is you can also pay them higher than that. So let's say that I'm a, I own a landscaping company and my prevailing wage determination comes back at $14 an hour, but 
last year, my guys are getting paid $16 an hour just went down this year. And I don't want my workers wages to actually go down. So I'm going to just pay my workers the $16 an hour. You can put that on your job order. You can advertise that to the U S workforce and you can pay them that. Uh, now what you don't want to do is you don't want to advertise the $14. Then when the guys get here, pay them all $16 because the department of labor is going to say that you should have disclosed that to the U S workforce. So it's a, uh, yeah, but generally you're paying the highest of the prevailing wage, the federal or state minimum wage. I've never seen a prevailing wage actually come back less than the federal minimum wage. I have seen prevailing wages come back at less than the state minimum wage, though. Uh, that's generally whenever a state adopts a new minimum wage standard. So, you know, if if Texas uh, had a mandatory $15 an hour minimum wage, a lot of prevailing wages would actually be lower than the state minimum wage for that year. Uh, so how can I, and can I get to the prevailing wage by using bonuses? So th this is a question that comes up all the time and there's not, it doesn't really end up being practical because you can't pay them less than the prevailing wage. And usually the bonuses are meant to incentivize you to get to, to uh, a specific wage rate, but you can never pay them less than the prevailing wage. So technically you can get there by paying them bonuses, but uh, it, it, only if it meets or exceeds the actual applicable wage rate. Uh, okay, so if the employer has minimum production standards as a condition of job re retention, it should be specified in the job order. So, and it's okay to have that. You, you can have efficiency standards, you can have effectiveness standards, you can have production standards, but it does need to be disclosed on the job order that you are expecting people to meet certain uh, minimum production standards. So if you own a landscaping company and you expect your workers to mow three lawns a day, uh, and that's a good thing to put in your actual job order because then whenever you have to fire someone for only mowing two lawns a day, you can easily point to it and say, they didn't meet my objective minimum production standard. Uh, so it's a good thing to check. So paying your HGB workers, how often do I need to pay my workers? At least once a month. Most of our clients either pay weekly or bi-weekly. Uh, sometimes we have people that pay on like the 1st and the 15th, uh, but every monthly is the minimum. Uh, but generally, it tends to be more frequent than that. What about taxes? H2B workers actually pay the same taxes as U.S. workers. So you, you need to, the taxes are actually the same for, from your perspective. H2B workers aren't entitled to some of the unemployment, state unemployment, federal unemployment, or uh, social security benefits, but they still pay the taxes for it. So, uh, all right. So let's talk about what's an unlawful deduction. What is an unreasonable deduction. This is what I was alluding to earlier. <clears throat> There's two types of deductions. An unlawful de deduction is one that uh, is, let's say that I own a construction company and I don't disclose any deductions on my job order. And I have a worker who up and left in the middle of the night stole $500 of my tools in the process and I owe them a check. Uh, and I, so I deduct the cost of those stolen tools from their check, but it wasn't disclosed on the job order. And so that would actually be an unlawful deduction because it was not disclosed on the job order. Uh, the other condition of an, of an unlawful deduction is one that uh, ends up violating the law. So let's say that I owe my, my worker gets paid $10 an hour. Uh, he worked 40 hours, so his check's $400. But when he left, he stole $350 of my tools. It was disclosed on the job order that I could make that deduction. But when I do make that deduction, uh, he, his check's only $50 for the 40 hours that he worked. Well, then you, you have an issue because you have an FLSA violation issue because the effective wage rate was less than the federal minimum wage. So uh, you, you can't deduct like that. The other, the other situation where there's an unreasonable deduction requirement. So let's say same circumstances. Uh, I have a worker 
paid ten dollars an hour, forty hours a week, four hundred dollars. He leaves in the middle of the night, but he only steals fifty dollars worth of stuff. But he really pissed me off because he stole fifty dollars worth of my stuff. It's going to take me an hour to go and replace that, uh, so I deduct a hundred dollars from him. I'm not in violation of the federal minimum wage requirements. It was disclosed on the job order, so it's not an unlawful deduction. But it, I did deduct twice as much as I uh, as the replacement cost of what he stole, which makes that an unreasonable deduction. So whenever you're thinking about deductions, they need to be both lawful and reasonable deductions. Okay, abandonment or termination. Let's say that your workers are here and one of your workers just ups and leaves in the middle of the night. You call them to get to work. Uh, you have to wait five days from uh, five consecutive unexcused absences. And at that point, you need to report it to the Department of Labor and the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we've got a form that we do this on, but it needs to be reported within 48 hours of that fifth day. Uh, or if you terminate a worker, you need to report it within 48 hours of the termination of that worker. Uh, so either way, you do need to report it to the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Labor. Okay, so this came up actually quite a bit during the pandemic. Uh, the work for your H2B workers fell through. What do you do now? Well, there's a provision in the regulations that has a contract and possibility provision that actually allows you to get out of the contract with the workers. Uh, you have to notify the Department of Labor first, though. Oh, so your, your first requirement is if you have an option to transfer the workers onto another application, you should do it. Uh, but let's say that option doesn't exist. Your work fell through the floor. Uh, supply chain issues are keeping you from performing the work that you thought you were going to be able to. So what do you do? You can notify the Department of Labor and then, but you have to wait for the Department of Labor to actually approve your justification. It has to be through no fault of your own. And then once they approve your justification, you still have to pay the workers expenses to return home, but you get out of the three quarter guarantee. Uh, so it, there is definitely some, some benefit to it there. That's, uh, that's all we got for the slideshow, but we can move into Q and A if there are any questions. I know we went through that pretty quick, but if you have any questions, you can go ahead and pop them right there in the, the Q and A section. I'll give people uh, two minutes here to think about any questions that they might have. Okay. What's a good time to file for employees and what does that process look like? Uh, yes. So the, whenever you're, you're filing for your workers, generally at least 105 days in advance, normally closer to 120 days in advance. The first thing you file is the prevailing wage determination right now. It's taking the Department of Labor 47 days to get those back to you. Uh, and then you have to file the job order in the 9142B at least 75 days in advance, but no more than 90 days in advance prior to the date of need. And so the determination on when to file is dictated by a couple of things. One, the employer seasonality. Two, if the employer has filed before in the past. And three, uh, if there's still cap space available. Uh, because the H2B visa program does have a numerical cap of 66,000 and it's allocated based off the government's fiscal year. So they allocate 33,000 for work that starts on October 1st, 33,000 for work that starts on April 1st. Uh, and so let's say you're applying for the October 1st cap, you would be filing your prevailing wage determinations uh, about a week ago, and you would be filing your 9142B in your job orders January 3rd to January 6th, ideally. Uh, is there a limit on how many years my same workforce can return? No, there's not. The, the one caveat there is your, uh, it, it would, it would depend on the nature of your work. You know, if you're, if you have two separate seasons or if you work in a bunch of different areas, you transfer your workers from one area to another and they don't leave the country. Uh, if that happens, then every three years, the workers do have to be home in their home country or out of the United States, really, uh, for 90 consecutive days. That's the big thing to know there. 
Uh, so question here, can you please repeat about bonuses? Yeah, so there's a few things to know about bonuses. The one question that comes up all the time is, can I bonus my H2B workers? And the answer is yes. You just need to have it disclosed on your job order in the first place. So be sure to uh, put in your job order the conditions for the bonus and what qualifies as a bonus. And then from there, uh, you can you can bonus them. Uh, now your, your bonuses are generally not used to get them to the prevailing wage though, that, because if you're doing it like that, they no, no matter what, they need to be paid at least the prevailing wage. Uh, okay. We've always offered our HB workers the option to enroll in our health insurance. We have never had any elected. This year we had several who have been interested. I've been told we may not be able to offer it to them since there's nothing in the job order talking about health insurance or deduction for it. Can we still offer health insurance to those who are interested in it? Uh, yes, yeah, so you, you would. Yes, uh, you can. You can offer health insurance, and you probably. It, this is a tricky question because it it does put you a little bit between a rock and a hard place, because you do have an issue where. Uh, you're gonna be offering them a benefit that wasn't disclosed on the job order. And so there's technically an H2B violation there, but the, the, and then same thing with the deduction for it, there's technically an H2B violation there, but one of the difficult positions that, that puts you in is you you're basically gonna be competing between Department of Labor Compliance and health insurance coverage uh, compliance, because a lot of times your health insurance provider will be the one that actually requires you to offer it to the HGB workers. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a tricky position. Uh, I would err on the side of offering it to them though, not, not offering it to them because the department of labor violation wouldn't be that significant for that. But, um, they, the consequences from your health insurance company, I would think would be a little bit more severe, but it would, uh, if you, email me separately about, you know, the, the specific circumstances, I'd be happy to, to walk you through it. Can a hog farm industry apply for, uh, to, uh, for H2A visa workers? It depends on the job function that they're performing. Uh, and if it's your H or your hog farm, uh, but generally, yeah, there's options for hog farm, hog farms to bring in H2A workers uh, for certain times of the year for certain types of work. So yeah, uh, if you want to know specifically what that would look like or what the circumstances are for you to get H2A workers, uh, just feel free to reach out to us uh, and we'll be able to talk you through that see if there's a good option for you. Does the employer pay for housing hotel during the time the workers are here? It depends on what your job order says. Under the H2B regulations, the employer is not required to provide housing. Uh, generally, employers will provide housing in some capacity, and then oftentimes will deduct the cost of the housing from the workers' checks, but that's something that needs to be disclosed specifically on the job order. So uh, some employers do provide housing, some employers don't, but it's not a requirement of H2B filings that employers do provide housing. So a lot of employers don't. What other questions might we have? Okay. All right. Do we have any other questions? Let me give probably another minute here to ask questions. Okay. Well, if we don't have any other questions, uh, then I guess we can we can go ahead and end this one. Uh, if you do have questions that pop up that you think about after the webinar, or if you rewatch this webinar and you think of other questions, then feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to help. Uh, you can also get on our website and watch 
bunch of other H2B webinars, H2A webinars, TN, green card, all, all that kind of fun stuff is on our website. So uh, feel free to, to use those resources. And if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to reach out. I appreciate everyone participating in all the questions.